Um, so I'm uh, Greg Conti, and the reason why I'm here is just to, to present some research, um, and really that's relevant to all of us, on the sensors in our lives, the instrumentation, and uh, the instru how our lives are becoming more and more instrumented, and where that could go. And, and I, I take it that we're really at a point where it's not if we can lead a private life uh, or what percentage of our life is private. It, it's more a matter of what percentage of our life is private and where that percentage will be in the future. So this talk's going to kind of cover this breadth, hopefully um, expanding. Uh, you know, there should be some things in here a little bit surprising for everybody, but just kind of think across the breadth of the problem and and it, see just really how much of our lives is instrumented. Um, I'm not gonna dwell on the usual suspects. So there's things that are pretty much common knowledge to people interested in privacy. We'll touch upon that, but I'm not gonna dwell in, uh, dig, oh, uh, dig deeply. <laughs> uh, dig deeply into uh, things that are, are pretty well trodden, more focusing on the breadth. And it's also, uh, we're going to look at some countermeasures, but really the countermeasures, and there's a, a wide range of things we can do, but I, I argue there's really no silver bullet uh, technology or policy countermeasure. This is almost like the tide, right? So we, can, we can't stop the tide, but maybe we can help divert the water and, or the, divert the direction a little more positively. And also, I, this is probably the lar one of the largest gatherings of privacy-aware folks in the world right now in this room. And... It's a good opportunity to throw some ideas around. So I'm interested in your questions and dialogue in the uh, Q&A room three after, afterwards as well. And if, if, uh, so I thought this slide was an appropriate way to start. This is a Ron Galela, uh, the godfather or the, the godfather of the American paparazzi. And here you can see him with his camera stacking, uh, stalking Jackie Onassis before the restraining order, of course. So no one, re no one actually reads um, disclaimers, so I thought it would be interesting to just translate it into different languages over and over again and back and forth and see what popped out. So I'll read that one. Uh, the viewpoints of views expressed by the author of the statement costumes and do not reflect the official policy of the University of Bow and the United States Army, Pentagon, U.S. government sector employment. So that's about as legible as the original um, or understandable, so I thought it'd be fun. So th as you go through this, think about the sensors in your lives. Think about the sensors you've invited. Uh, think about the ones you don't know are there and what you've traded uh, for, you know, sometimes you have an opt-in option, sometimes you have an opt-out option, uh, sometimes you have no option. And just to think through that as you see the different ideas we throw forward. First off, it's surprisingly difficult to find pictures of uh, people wearing ninja masks taken by ATM cameras, uh, but uh, so I apologize if this is someone in the room. Uh, but the, uh, the Nashville Police Department uh, had, a, uh, had a set online, so I, it was, uh, I took advantage of it. Uh, but uh, joking aside, this uh, we don't want to live in a world where we have to wear a ninja mask to preserve some element of our privacy. And when you think about how information is being gathered, uh, sometimes it's relentless. Uh, has anyone tried to avoid taking the census? Yeah, how did that go? <laughs> right, they're pretty relentless. Um, and, you know, robocallers calling your homes, trying to make contact, satellites flying overhead, cars driving around the streets with cameras on top. I mean, really, who could have thunk that 20 years ago, uh, mapping the whole country? And, and sometimes we go to them. Um, you know, there were people uh, it, it, who went to Black Hat, had, you know, they, they had a barcode on the badge, and if you went up to a vendor booth, they'd scan your badge, and, and you got some trinket in return. And literally, people were getting, giving, and that was probably uh, at the cost of a lifetime of spam through that, from that company. Uh, so people were going up to get a button with a blue blinky light on it from one vendor. So they've traded a lifetime of spam from a company for a blue blinky light. And these are security experts. 
Uh, but, but really, it's not the people in this room. I mean, everyone in this room is aware, right? You, you're able to defend yourselves to the degree you wish to be defended. Uh, but the, we have to really think in terms of everybody else, the people walking around pushing strollers with uh, six, you know, six kids walking through Caesars and walking up and down the strip, the people who buy do bottles of Dr. Pepper and... Uh, and go to the website and type in the code. Uh, the people who respond to surveys printed on their, um, on their restaurant receipt. Does anyone want to admit to having done that? Did you win? A, anyone win any of the, did anyone, you won? Someone won. Ah, very cool. So, I mean, it's, they offer, you know, I always thought the odds were like one in 10 billion or something to actually win, so very cool. Um, and no talk on privacy is complete without a discussion of the Panopticon, which is uh, a design that uh, this is a, a, of a prison. Uh, but the, what they're getting at is people behave differently when they're being surveilled, ideally when anonymously surveilled. And that was part of a prison design. So it's something to think about how, these, how this instrumentation influences our society. And then what will the data, what insights will this data provide? And we're really hitting a point now where we can be uh, predictive. We can predict m what masses of people will do. We can, I, I believe, we can predict what largely individuals can do based on the sums of the data being collected. Now, of course, this, this instrumentation serves dual purposes. So uh, I'm not saying that it's all bad, and, uh, nor that it's all good. But what we really need to do is think about the right balance and the right ways we can prevent. It's kind of like the Wild West out there. People are running amok and finding the right limits on behavior by those collecting the data. So this talk starts off with, uh, kind of walks through the data collection in your personal life uh, a little bit online. I'm really staying in the analog space here uh, because I think in the real world it impacts us. You know, people think about it a little bit less perhaps. Uh, and, and in your home, uh, community, some countermeasures, and then where the technology is going. So as you see these different sensors, um, or platforms that, uh, that I'll present, th it, it's useful to kind of think through various facets of them. You know, uh, what's the sensor? What's its capabilities? Is it analog or digital? Does it have a power source? So if you're going to hack this thing or try and influence it in some way, it's good to know how it works. What are its strengths and weaknesses? What's the input? Um, what is it sensing? What is the subject? Is the, what's the environment it's operating in? Is there a warning? or a public warning, do people know about it, warning or not? Uh, is there a privacy policy? Uh, is it an understandable privacy policy? Can you opt in? Can you opt out? Or is it, a real, is it some sort of realistic opt out? Like you can opt out if you stop breathing air kind of opt out. And are you complicit? Have you made a decision to uh, be engaged by this uh, in return for something? How, where is the data being retained? How much of it is being retained? Is it ever destroyed? And I think that's something we need to think about, to think a lot more about, is it's often in the best uh, interest of those collecting the data to not destroy it. Certainly, um, it's all about incentives. Is there incentive for the data to be destroyed? If a company's worried about being subpoenaed, perhaps they'll delete their email over time. Uh, but that, that's a potential solution that can be valuable, and I think one that's actually workable on a large scale is the idea of maybe pushing forward on the idea of destruction. A lifespan, you know, the idea of learning, uh, learning, teaching ourselves to forget because humans forget and it works pretty well. Uh, but, uh, you know, with the cost of hard drives, it's, it's trivial to retain data often uh, infinitely. What type of processing is taking place, either on the device or post processing? Are they processing for uniqueness? Can they tell, it, maybe they don't know who the identity of an individual, but if an individual pops up again, can they tell it's the same person? Is that type of activity taking place? Are, is, the, is it such a resolution where they can tie it to a database of individuals in some way? Any other data mine, are, is there any other data mining uh, taking place? How is it being communicated? Is it being communicated in real time, near real time, uh, in a batch? You know, if you've got a, you know, a, a given device, are you syncing it with something else with network, tech, uh, network connectivity? Uh, does the, what's the odds of it leaking? And finally, who's consuming that information? Is it just being stored or is it being consumed in some fashion? There's those that you know 
and those that you don't know. And those people that you don't know, how did they get their hands on it? Thinking about processing, we'll cover some automated means later in the talk, but there's also just some interesting innovations of enlisted crowdsourcing <laughs> surveillance. Uh, this is the Internet Eyes website. It's uh, out of the EU, and they allow anonymous viewers to earn points by monitoring video cameras um, uh, and then reporting things they see. Uh, so, uh, and the winner of, earns a thousand pound uh, monthly prize. The runner-ups get included in a thank you list. And you can see at the bottom just an example of the, the view that, that they demonstrate. And it should come as no surprise for people in this room. What boat is this? So the Exxon Valdez. And I, I collected this more than 100 days ago, so there's probably other examples that could be used. <laughs> but it, it should come as no surprise in, in, to anyone in this room that information is slippery. It has a way of legally and Ill illegally spilling. And you know, the idea, again, it comes back to the idea of, of destroying the data at some point, learning to forget may be valuable. And there's this trend that it's a lot easier if there's something unique. As you're trying to analyze this data, people are trying to find ways to uniquely identify individuals or devices or, or, and the like. Uh, an interesting example is that of firearm micro-stamping, where the firing pin has a small number on it. You fire the gun, the casing pops out, and there's a serial number on the casing. Uh, the idea of digital cameras. <clears throat> Uh, the idea of digital cameras, that pixel noise in the, in the sensor can be used to uniquely identify a camera, uh, potentially, and that that can uh, tell what photo was taken by what camera. Uh, and, but there's this wide range, and the EFF has a, a very nice list on their website and some other places. But thinking about your social security number, the, your, your DNA, there's talk now of um, if one person's arrested for a crime, uh, they can tell, uh, they could potentially tell uh, that a family member uh, of that person could, ma could match close enough to a person who uh, committed another crime. So if, if, if I committed something and my brother did something, they could, and they had a DNA sample of my brother but didn't know who that was, uh, there's some ongoing legal debate whether they can, uh, they can use that, uh, that, that's enough probable cause to bring in, uh, bring in my brother. And then a wide variety, I mean, it seems like every facet of our lives, is there, people are trying to find ways to make it unique so it can be tracked. And you've, you've probably, uh, well, certainly biometrics is all about that. Um, I mean, people who are ham radio operators know that you, that you can tell a person, experienced operators can tell a person by their, their fist how they, how they send Morse code. Um, gate recognition, uh, printers and copiers, the idea of putting micro dots on there so that they can be tracked. So anyway, the, I wanted to, what I wanted to get at here is the idea that uniqueness is important, uh, a facet of what we're talking about. The, and there are other emerging technologies, and this I didn't make up, this is from Chat Roulette. There is apparently a problem. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but it's, it's useful, I mean, it's all about incentives, right? So people are finding ways to, uh, motivations to, uh, to collect and perform, you know, ongoing analysis of, of data. Uh, and then sensors, sensors are getting cheaper, they're becoming more embedded in toys, in our phones, and millions of other places. And it's just, the cost is dropping. So let's look at things you might carry on your person. And you can think of the idea of RFID tags and clothing, uh, that you may get custom clothing made online. There's a kid's website now that kids can go online and design custom clothes, and then three weeks later, it'll show up to their house. Uh, you, as an opt-in option, you may have chosen to uh, use the Nike plus iPod system and put a sensor in your shoe. Uh, and again, think about this is today, and you have to look into the future and say, where is this going? Uh, one of the biggest culprits is your phone. Uh, sent more and more sensors are, are be becoming embedded. Uh, the idea of applications, some of them arguably not all that trustworthy, performing activity, phones may be automatically updated. We don't know what type of remote control uh, the, the uh, service provider may have. Uh, so you, and there's often a location, a GPS activity as well. Uh, I think it would be an interesting, so as I go through this, I'll throw out a couple of topics I think would be interesting research topics. 
And, and I'm interested in the idea, and I'll, I'll get this later, of software phoning home. Um, but it's, you know, people have performed packet capture on their home network, and it's, it's relatively straightforward to do that. Uh, I'm concerned that no one's, that not enough people are looking at what is actually phoning home from your phone. Right, so what are these applications doing? It's, it's a higher bar to entry. So I think it'd be interesting to continue to watch that space. And not just the applications, but uh, from third parties, but from the actual providers themselves. It'd be interesting to watch. And then things like, like um, you know, next generation watches. The Garmin FR80 uh, automatically transfers data to your PC or Mac, and it's, uh, it monitors your heart rate and, and other things. And you can share it through the Garmin Connect online community. What will watches look like in the future? Of course, there's books. When they're not deleting your copy of 1984, uh, we have to assume that they, they certainly have the technical ability and there's probably the financial incentive uh, from the companies to track what you're reading, when you're reading it, how fast you read, all of that. That's just another input in, into this. Um, Online, you could, we could go on and on. We could spend a whole day just discussing online, but I, I've just focused on a couple here. Think about it. eHarmony, people are disclosing enough information about themselves in a survey to find a mate for life, okay? That's the one company. So think about this, what we've covered, the different facets, the different types of things that we are, uh, what we're disclosing. And then what, are these being combined in some way? Clearly, social networking. I mean, I, I, I tend to believe that each time you know we get a connection from someone else, a little bit of our privacy dies along the way. Particularly, I kind of like thinking about people from high school. I, I, you know, or this other part of my life, and then no one knows of that connection until they pop up and, and join a social network. Uh, there's a, a website called um, Hunch, which is looking at the idea of social search personalize the, the internet. And what they do is they ask people to uh, answer questions. And you answer those questions, it'll provide personalized search. So there's this balance between, or this tension between personalization and, uh, this, this tension between personalization and privacy. You, know, you get more personalized service, the more you disclose about yourself, potentially. And, uh, and then the idea of location-aware uh, games and other activities. Uh, but there's this, this general theme of finding ways to find the people who are pushing the strollers up and down Caesar's Palace uh, to disclose information about themselves. Finding some fun way. We give them a badge. We make them a mayor. We, do all, we give them another star on their friggin', you know, web, web account or whatever to trade for personal information. And the idea of our, our software is phoning home. It absolutely is. So I would suggest this. I mean, if, if I had an infinite amount of time, I'd spend a year taking all the different types of applications, loading them one at a time, seeing what they're phoning home, uh, because they got to be doing it. Sometimes they ask. Sometimes they have it buried in defaults. And other times, certainly, they're not asking. And these are le legitimate companies. So you also have to thank our government. There's plenty of, line, uh, plenty of photos available of people hanging fire detector or smoke detectors in their homes. So let's take a look at some of the things in your home. And, where, and also think about where this is going. For example, cable boxes. There's experimentation ongoing, and this isn't fielded or anything, but the idea of putting different camera technologies in your cable box to tell if people are in the room, right? So they can tell if that people are watching the advertising or not. It would allow targeted advertising. And again, I'm not going to go into the computer, but just think of it as this uh, multifaceted sensor uh, that you're typing information into that may have cameras hooked up, microphones, fingerprint readers, and, and the like. And it's also a, a facilitator of communications. Ah, this being DEF CON, who has uh, modified a Teddy Ruxpin? Who's tortured a Teddy Ruxpin in their past? We have one. We have a few. Furbies, anyone with a Furby? Yes, a couple, Some, sometimes the same people. So and <laughs> these, are, uh, these are technologies, toys are becoming, are including more and more sensors, right? And are they probably syncing with PCs and are, well, eventually will have wireless connectivity or may already, do, uh, may already have wireless connectivity. So what are they collecting? 
what thinking about our games. This is micro, this is Project Natal, now called uh, Connect, uh, Microsoft Connect. Uh, it has a depth, depth sensing camera. It can ID and track body parts, and it's uh, I believe it's on sale in November. Uh, they're talking about it being useful for a home security system. Um, but they say it's just a question of whether it's socially acceptable to do that type of thing, having a, a camera looking in on people. Uh, our appliance, well, let me take a step back. Isn't it a great world we live in if you can sell a refrigerator just by putting a pretty girl next to it? Um, it it's kind of shameless. But... <laughs> Um, so, but the idea of uh, internet toasters, everything is becoming uh, internet aware, will include sensors, you know, food consumption, for example. The idea of geotagging being uh, capabilities being built into cameras, GPS, you know, automatically tagging the, the photos. And more, uh, smart power meters are on the horizon. Automa home automation is on the horizon. And each of these things have the ability, these are sensors, they have the ability to collect information. And this, some, you know, the, some of the older technologies, not so much, but as we move forward, certainly more and more. Uh, I had a question, I was showing this to a friend, he asked about the smart urinal. Um, I, I haven't done too much research on smart urinals, but I, I, I'm, I recall seeing the idea of putting urinalysis technology embedded in a urinal, so if you can tell if your, your troubled youth is using drugs or something like that. Um, and then there's a spoof video that we'll get to later in the talk. Uh, people are wiring up their house plants, saying, thank you for watering me, urgent, please water me. People, best men, have wired up their, the, the bride and groom's honeymoon bed to say they're on the job. They're, on, uh, they're off the job. Action, uh, action concluded. Yes, 12 minutes. <laughs> it gets better. And of course, there are pleasure model robots on the horizon. Uh, these are about $5,000 and available in Japan. I won't ask if anyone owns one. But God knows what they'll be uh, collecting. <laughs> I also think kind of shamelessly, this would be an interesting research topic for someone in the room. Uh, I don't know if the National Science Foundation will go for it, but perhaps. Uh, okay, so thinking about, that was our home, that was our person, that was our home. And just, and there's plenty of, now most of these, uh, well, th this is uh, the idea of just surveillance cameras in virtually every, you know, small store we go into. The fact that uh, blood samples are taken by children or uh, from babies almost uh, soon after they're born. And then all the, the it, I could have gone on and on about the data being collected in a hospital. Where is that being collected? Obviously there's benefits to that, but is it being protected? Is it being destroyed when appropriate? And that's how, it raises those questions. And then at the gym, we're getting more and more uh, smarter and smarter technologies. Some of you may have, you, know, you can put on a, a belt, a wireless belt around your chest and it'll collect telemetry off the, off the human, you know, the heart rate, that type of thing. And, and you have to think into the future. Where is this going, right? Gunshot detectors instrumenting our neighborhoods or not. And again, I have to thank the United States government for making available pictures of your analysis tests. Uh, but you have to think about other, how, how your life is being sampled. And this is literally a sample in a little plastic bottle. Um, in, in England, they were very big for a while on keystroke logging to make sure their workers were working, although workers tend to have, find a way around such things. Uh, your employer may require a polygraph. Where is, this, you know, where is this going? What are the incentives for the employers? Um, anyone gone to Disney, Disney World, Disneyland, and had to get uh, your thumbprint read? Fingerprints red. At the Super Bowl, they've, and this kind of show, illustrates emerging technologies or showcasing of emerging technologies, the idea of using facial recognition at, in various public forums to, to identify people. Uh, clearly, the, um, 
the various uh, frequent shopper cards for grocery stores. Uh, you get, and it's pretty significant. I mean, you get a pretty significant discount or penalty if you do not participate. But think about, think of all the things we've looked at already and more and more pieces in our space to operate is becoming more and more constrained, uh, operate privately is becoming more and more constrained. There's incentives, sometimes small, sometimes large, to, to opt into this stuff. And it's emerging from the grocery store, a little plastic tag, to your cell phone being this general purpose, uh, general purpose loyalty card. And it, it says, no one in advertising has been able to figure out how to do one-to-one -one real time marketing. The mobile phone is where that will probably happen. It's the only thing connected and always with you. Think about that. And, and clearly, finance is becoming more and more uh, uh, electronic. Uh, at the same time, sadly, phone, you know, anonymous phone calls are becoming far more and more difficult. And there's been various movements to uh, to limit or, or the or prevent uh, the idea of anonymous purchasing anonymous cell phones, the throwaway cell phones. In our car, and from the from, it seems like every can you how far can you drive in your car? Maybe if you've got a 1965, you know, Mustang or something like that, or a 66 Mustang, you can, you can drive it anonymously until you get the first red light camera, the, the first electronic toll collection. Um, there's license plate readers. There's some great videos of that technology online. There's uh, LoJack radar and laser uh, sensing, speed sensing, and of course the black box. Where is that going to going, be going? Where are the incentives? It's certainly, there's com insurance companies will give, um, you know, uh, have pilot programs out there to give a discount if someone allows them to, you know, instrument their car and, and to tell if they're a good there's good behavior or not. And of course, travel by air, and the, it's becoming less and less fun. And travel by train. Right? Think about it. How can you get around right now? How can you get from point A to point B without someone knowing about it? Okay, so, so these are countermeasures. Uh, like I said, there isn't a silver bullet in here, but there's some, I think, things that can be used to influence the, the flow of, of the debate, perhaps. Some of these things are illegal, okay? Uh, please talk, talk to a lawyer if you're uncertain. And I'm not a lawyer. So the first countermeasure is living in the 19th century. Does anyone live off the grid? We probably have a few people in the room who more or less live off the grid or attempt to. Oh, and whose house is this? Yeah, that's the Ted Kaczynski's house uh, before he uh, went away. Uh, but that's not entirely, living in the 19th century is not uh, altogether satisfactory. Uh, and living in the 20th century, it's, even if people are trying, I mean, it's, it's a, really we want to be citizens of the 21st century and, and, and have some checks and balances in place. The idea of using paper money and the phone book and our library card is, and paper mail isn't really the right answer either. Uh, but one solution is to disclose that surveillance is taking place. Uh, technologies to detect that sensing is taking place. Uh, and obviously in the, you know, certain communities there's professionals who sweep rooms to detect if sensing is taking place. Uh, community monitoring, collabor uh, collective monitoring of the sensors in their neighborhood. This is the New York City surveillance camera project is another kind of way to provide a little pushback and a little on a transparency on what's going on. And this has to be the best security picture of all time. <laughs> it, if anyone has the original, I mean, you, you'll see this in one out of every t other talk here. It's kind of like the Panopticon, but it's awesome. And I, if anyone has the original high resolution version of this, please sell posters. This is really a keepsake. But the idea of bypassing what you don't want. Um, anybody work in a Faraday room or have worked in a Faraday room? Yeah. Um, anyone have license plate covers for red light cameras? They make special license plate covers. Do, does anyone know if they work? How well they work? Ah, uh, they don't work. Dang. Okay. Well, they're available online. 
And then there's other technologies, shielding technologies, RFID blocking wallets, radar camouflaging paint, and the like. And again, none of these are entirely a good fit. Do you want to live your life at a Faraday cage? No. Oh, I heard yes, but they're okay. <laughs> Most people probably don't. Uh, the idea you can jam technologies. This is running water. Uh, the idea of you know the, the white noise helps prevent surveillance. I saw it in a spy movie. But anyway, you could find a faucet of running water online from the main uh, state government, actually. So apparently they're trying to conserve water. And, the, and the, there's the idea of vibrating windows to prevent, because uh, your voice will, will vibrate windows and that can be sensed using a laser interferometer. Um, and, and this is one in particular, please don't do this. But certainly if you don't own it, but that disabling sensors, I mean, black tape can be one of the best sensor disablers out there, particularly if you own, you know, you don't want the camera on your laptop to always be staring at you. Um, you can take out the batteries, you can, people have microwaved RFIDs. Uh, and if you've been to some of the security shows, they'll give out the little plugs that, oh, here's one. These guys, the little things that plug into your, um, into your microphone jack to hardware disable your microphone. And this is very, very cool, I thought. It's, um, you can express your displeasure in a public way. So this uh, individual, I don't, don't have his name handy, but he was disappointed in his, the, the use of speed uh, cameras in his community. So when the Bluff City, Tennessee domain name went up for sale, uh, he purchased it. The Bluff City Police Department domain name became, you know, they expired. He purchased it, uh, took it out from underneath them, and then put up his own website about speed cameras. So I thought that was pretty good. Uh, art can be in a very effective tool. You're trying to communicate to the masses. Art is a mechanism to do that. And if there are any art students in the room, I think it'd be a really interesting area to explore. You can certainly find other means to, <laughs> to uh, rally community support because that's kind of what it takes to, to, ha to force governments to perform a, muscle, a major muscle movement. And you may have heard stories about the English villagers expressing displeasure. I don't know if they had pitchforks and torches, uh, but they definitely made it known that they did not like street view cameras, of uh, street view cars in their community. Um, certainly, there, you know, embarrassment is another, another tool uh, that will perhaps change behavior. Um, you can spoof, you know, the spoof, sensors can be spoofed, and this uh, researcher is uh, holding, uh, you know, by, uh, fingers. <laughs> uh, many ways, uh, other ways that uh, awareness can be raised. I mean, Cory Doctorow's book, uh, Little, uh, Little Brother, uh, very good, it's very, and, and, but it, and it can reach to audiences and to young people and help change perceptions. Uh, there's the uh, top right's uh, uh, a YouTube video, ironically, hosted by Google, that's a, a parody of where Google could go. Uh, it's the free, you get the free Google toilet and it analyzes your <clears throat> activities. But it, it you know, sends a message and, and gets it out there. And then and movies like The Minority Report, I mean, that really saw some things coming and reached a broad audience. And we need to get our arms around anonymization a little better, ideally transparent anonymization. That the, it's, if not done correctly, people have shown you can go work backwards. And each time you anonymize the data, you perhaps dilute its value to the holder. Uh, but this and you know, the idea of aging data and destroying data is something that, that merits future work. But the, again, it has to have incentive. The, the, whoever has the data has to be incentivized to do these things. And, if, and one way to do that is by uh, voting with your wallet, engaging policymakers. And again, the governments have lots of good pictures of people engaging policymakers because they pretend to like that thing. Um, the, uh, there's, there are policy solutions. This is uh, one out of uh, Database Nation. It was a Canadian Standards uh, Association code for protecting personal information, but it was, it was pretty thoughtful. So policy is part of this. Helping teach, uh, dis uh, you know, inform decision makers is part of this. And of course, one way to, to, uh, to get head toward this is voting with your vote. Although it's more important that really we need the many. We don't need the one onesie twosies. We need the many to help influence these things. 
I like the idea of supporting opt-in in general because it, it allows people to collect data for those willing to do it, but they have to make a conscious choice. I thought a great example was the HOPE badge, and this was in 08. They gave an active RFID badge, and they handed you the battery separately. And they said, there's an active RFID in here if you'd like to be part of the project where uh, we, we collect, um, I think, attendee metadata project. If you'd like to be part of that, it's cool, it's, an, it, it's anonymous, uh, but you, you opt in by putting the battery in your device. And you, when you want to opt out, you take the battery out. Uh, the idea of collecting and uh, conducting interesting research and sharing it. Uh, I had put this in there uh, before, I think this is yeah, Peter, Peter Eckersley, and ha actually he's uh, speaking uh, next hour on this project. But the idea of doing interesting, relevant research in the space and sharing it. Finding other like-minded individuals, and these are some of the places that they, uh, that they well, besides DEF CON, that they may appear. Uh, the Computers Freedom and Privacy Conference, uh, research in the, uh, often you'll see research presented, workshop on privacy in the electronic society, or privacy enhancing technology symposium, and there's more out there. And of course, supporting your privacy champion of choice, EFF, EPIC being two examples. And I think it's important that we think about privacy by design, that how many, you know, some, does your laptop have a little flap that you can slide over the camera to make sure it's not collecting anything? Uh, this is a coffee table. Um, the, I, so you, it's a coffee table and shredder. Ten, okay, thank you. Um, and also, now I showed this to a friend and he said, are you over, <laughs> Are you, think, are you mentioning overthrow of the government here? No, I'm not talking about overthrow of the government. I was going with the top line. And I think the idea of common sense being most important here, uh, part of the problem. So let's take a quick look at the future. Emerging technologies, things like through the wall radar are on the horizon. Internet scale experimentation, the idea that um, Google, for example, tried a Bing-like background and it didn't go over well. It was planned to be a 24-hour experiment. But the idea, and people let them know that we don't like this. Uh, but they were able to find out. I mean, those people, you know, when you get numbers like that, you get the statistical uh, significance in the results. And you can really, and it can be subtle experimentation, but it, we can do it on, large online companies can do that type of thing. We are seeing, uh, you know, I wouldn't be surprised to see electronic license plates. Ah, and there's, uh, we're, you know, this site, a uh, kid's eyes is, uh, it, it, it convinces parents to sign their kids up to take surveys from ages six to 12, and teenagers too, and provides them some nominal trinket in return or funding in return. Think about the future where we have wearable computing. People are working now, have done experiments trying to use technologies such as um, the MRI to see how people, um, how they think. And one experiment was uh, you know, people were asked to predict what they were going to do based on a certain set of you know, information. And 50% were able to do it, predict what they would do correctly. Well, the MRI experiment sh was able to predict with 75% accuracy. So more accurate than the human. Uh, the idea of network science and mining uh, user data. This was just an example of a recent AT&T project uh, that mined cell phone records and was, could, could tell travel habits and how far New Yorkers traveled on weekends based on their cell phone activity. And there's uh, an interesting group at MIT that is exploring this idea of reality mining, uh, exploring themes like uh, organizational dynamics, um, and complex social systems from this data, this sampling of the real world. There are people performing interesting research, trying to dig, um, dig the most they can, analyze the most they can out of the data. And it's also important to realize that the uh, that it's this data is probably not being thrown away. So advanced technologies can be played back against um, historical data. The future of augmented reality, same, same type of thing. And the emerging Internet of Things, where virtually every item will be connected to the Internet in some or tracked by the Internet in some way, it just opens up ample opportunities. So I, this is, what is this a map of? Besides the United States, I know that. 
It's, yeah, ra it's a radiation fallout from probable targets. It's kind of a Cold War era thing. And it, you know, where, so it shows where you should live uh, in the event of fallout. Now, I, I showed this to a friend who happens to be Canadian, and he said, obviously, you should live in Canada because there's nothing up there. Um, and it was a good, a good point. But my, the reason why I included this here is because our space to operate anonymously I, I, or privately is, is dwindling rapidly. And I really think it's, we're at the point where it's not a matter of if we can do it at all. It's what percentage of our life is being instrumented and to think that through. And there's probably an interesting model there that could be built. So with that, again, the government's great. They have pictures of them, freely available pictures of hanging sensors. So with that, are there any questions? Oh, well, okay. So uh, we'll, we'll take it to the Q&A room, which is room three, which is you go out the, to the main hallway, turn right, and immediately on your left. Thank you very much. <laughs>